Hello you beautiful misfits, my name is Matt and this is Pixel Burn, where I take a snarky look at some of the more important, interesting or irritating things to have popped up in the week's gaming news. And our first topic this week, piracy. Not that kind of piracy. I'm talking about good old fashioned video game piracy of course, an issue that has clung to video games like their very own shadow ever since video games, well, first existed really, despite the best efforts of developers to counteract it. In the early days, said efforts usually involved some sort of code you had to input before a game would let you continue past certain points, usually from a code wheel, a specially printed code sheet that could only be read through a piece of coloured cellophane, or a specific page in the game's manual, with a code on it. There was also a weird thing called lens lock, but we don't talk about that. Modern anti-piracy techniques are just as much an inconvenient pain in the arse of course, yet also more sophisticated and varied. There are draconian approaches such as always requiring a connection to the game's servers, mischievous ones like forcing the main character to wear an eye patch throughout the whole game, or ones that straight up fuck with the player's enjoyment of their ill-gotten game, such as the coding trick in pirated versions of Mirror's Edge that slowed you down right before big jumps for example. Although none of them are quite as funny as a game's DLC coming bundled with full blown malware that rips all the saved passwords from your Google Chrome browser and sends them to the developers. <laughs> Wait, no. No. That's not funny at all. The DLC in question is the functionally named A320-X from Flight Sim Labs, a third party purveyor of add-ons for Microsoft Flight Simulator, although it's more technically correct to call it a paid mod, since the last version of Microsoft Flight Simulator came out in 2006 and is no longer officially supported by Microsoft. People who like flight sims really like flight sims though, and they're not the types to let little details like a lack of official support stop them from enjoying it. As such, a niche industry has sprung up around the title and others, with people adding their favourite real world planes, textures, airports etc for other flight sim enthusiasts to enjoy either for free or for a price. Some of you might bulk at the idea of paying almost £30 for a single plane, a PA42 Cheyenne 3 in this case, but bear in mind these are being developed usually by hobbyists for a game that is no longer officially supported and for a very specialised and highly dedicated enthusiast audience. More power to him, I say. Anyhow, one such flight sim enthusiast, a Reddit user by the name of Cranky Recursion, recently discovered the installer for Flight Sim Labs A320 Airbus add-on contained an additional file called test.exe, which is only a teeny bit less suspicious seeming than notavirus.exe. So Cranky Recursion did some research, found out pretty quickly that the file was a password scraper then took their concerns to their fellow enthusiasts on Reddit to see if they could help shed some light on why it was included in what should have been a trusted installer. From there the matter swiftly came to the attention of a chap named Andrew Mabbitt, co-founder of cybersecurity firm Fidus Information Security, who ran some tests to answer some important questions it raised. Questions like, were the scraped passwords sent to Flight Sim Labs? How was that data being secured? Who had access to it? what was the data being used for, and what on earth were they thinking? There was actually an official answer to that last one, but we'll get to that later. For now, here's a quick summary of what Fidus Information Security discovered. During the installation process, the test.exe file and several others are secretly extracted to a temporary directory on a user's machine. The installer then first determines whether or not the version of the Airbus add-on the user has is a legit purchased copy by checking their order ID, serial number or email against Flight Sim Labs server database. If you were found to be a legit customer, then the malware would be deleted. How considerate of them. And the add-on would install as normal. If the installer found your innocence to be wanting, however, that's when the unethical fun would begin. Firstly, Test.exe would scrape all your stored Chrome passwords and dump them into a log file called log.txt. Another file included in the installer, base64.exe, was then used to encode, not encrypt, the log file before it was then sent over HTTP back to Flight Sim Labs. Not HTTPS, no. The encoded, not encrypted log file was sent to them over regular old unsecured HTTP to a target server connected to the internet running remote desktop protocol without a firewall. Or in layman's terms, the internet equivalent of shouting your bank details to someone on the other side of a busy street. Speaking to Motherboard on the subject, Andrew Mabbitt summed it up as follows. 
This is by far one of the most extreme and bizarre methods of digital rights management we've ever seen. In this official response, wherein the word apologise appears twice and the word sorry appears once, Flight Sim Labs attempted to justify their actions. According to them, genuine customers were never at risk. While the malware was unpacked onto their machines, it would only activate in specific circumstances. In their own words, as soon as the user entered their customer information, order ID, serial number, email, it verified this against our server database. Genuine customers and any other legitimate serial numbers trigger a full proper installation and no tool was called slash used to figure out any pirate info. We're sorry we scattered a skip full of steel claw bear traps around the overgrown field next to the local kindergarten. But they were only intended to catch paedophiles. Flight Sim Labs were also keen to clarify that the digital toxic waste they'd secreted onto their customers' machines without their knowledge or consent was only there temporarily. The installer that temporarily extracted the tool would remove it as part of its normal cleanup operation upon proper installation completion. Okay, okay, so we broke into your house and took a big wet steaming shit on your carpet. We cleaned it up afterwards. We're not monsters. If the whole idea of deliberately putting malware on their customers' machines wasn't already mad enough, it gets more bonkers. According to Flight Sim Labs, this entire scheme was purely to catch one certain individual who'd been distributing their work on certain invitation-only websites. Again, in their own words, safeguards on our servers ensured there was no possibility that any user other than the one targeted would actually have his personal details compromised. We profoundly apologise for contaminating the city's water supply with a modified strain of Ebola. But our scientists have assured us it only affects puppy murderers. We're all perfectly safe. Flight Sim Labs' end goal was to steal this pirate's login details for these illicit sites, confirm they were distributing their add-ons illegally, then, and I quote, forward the information to proper legal authorities. Now, I'm not a lawyer, but I've seen enough crime shows to be pretty sure that in most jurisdictions, evidence obtained illegally isn't admissible as evidence. Because it was obtained illegally. Speaking of illegality, some of the team at Flight Sim Labs are based in the UK and could fall afoul of the Computer Misuse Act of 1990 if they were found to be knowingly involved in this mad scheme. Because under this particular act, it is an offence to purposefully spread malicious and damaging software, as Flight Sim Labs did when they bundled the malware into their installer. In the wake of a quite frankly justified backlash from their customers, Flight Sim Labs have replaced the add-on installer in question with one that doesn't take a shit on your hard drive, swore never to try such a stupid fucking thing ever again, and conveyed their most humble apologies. Although one thing Flight Sim Labs could have genuinely said in their defence but didn't is that they're not the first to try using malware as DRM. In 1986, a chap called Amjad Farooq Alvi and his brother Basit created a computer virus called Brain, regarded as the first MS-DOS virus in history, to deter people from pirating some medical heart monitoring software they had developed. The virus would slow down a machine's floppy disk drive and make 7 kilobytes of RAM completely unavailable for DOS to use. That may not sound like much nowadays, but the average IBM PC back then only had between 16k and 256k of RAM in total. Brain managed to spread beyond its humble origins in Lahore, Pakistan, to as far afield as the UK and USA, where it infected many legitimate users of the Alvi Brothers software. It wasn't a destructive virus, and it didn't steal your personal details. It actually had the brothers' address and telephone number buried in the code but it was still detrimental to an extent and, ultimately, didn't work to deter people from piracy. Because the very notion of there being such a thing as good malware is inherently dumb. It's got mal in it. it comes from malus, the Latin word for bad. You can't have good badware. That's just stupid. In other news, Assassin's Creed Oregano got a sizable and highly anticipated update this week, the Discovery Tour Mode. A pure discovery mode for people to not only explore at their leisure and without the worry of combat, though you can still barge into people on the streets like an asshole, but also get some actual historical learning from, with fully voiced guided tours to partake in all over the in-game map. Within minutes of starting, however, I found something that kind of soured me a wee bit on the whole experience, much to my sadness and disappointment. 
something kind of important for a product touting itself as a historical education tool. Here's the problem. Every single statue of a topless lady has acquired a bra made of seashells, while every statue of a man brandishing his <clears throat> mentula has been similarly modestified, which led me to wonder what other historical titillation had been removed or obscured, which led me to immediately fast travel to the arena town of Crocodile Town and make a beeline to the brothel there, where my gravest fears were confirmed. There was ancient Greek porn here. It's gone now. Literally whitewashed from history. Hypatia of Alexandria would be turning in her grave. If she hadn't been dismembered, burned and her ashes scattered to the winds by a bloodthirsty mob of ignorant half-witted fanatics. As easy as it might be to stamp my feet and get into a strop at Ubisoft, I completely understand why they did this. I don't agree with it, but I can at least understand. You see, while Assassin's Creed Origins Discovery Tour is a free update to Assassin's Creed Origins, it's also being sold as a separate, cheaper product on Steam and Uplay. Regular Stabby Stabby Murderfest Origins is rated 18 by Peggy and has uncensored nudity. Peaceful historical tour version of Origins that Ubisoft could sell to schools as an educational tool has a Peggy rating of 12. But to get that age rating, Ubisoft had to remove the tits, dicks and brothel smut otherwise known as the colourful and interesting bits of human history. Even though Animal Crossing, rated by Peggy as suitable for ages 3 and up, lets you own either a statue of David with his bits on full, albeit low resolution display, or a statue of Venus with her baps out for all to see. Although it's not being marketed to schools as a teaching aid either. Hmm, we thinks Nintendo are missing a trick there. All jokes aside, much of human history is filthy and lewd. Not everyone in the ancient world was some erudite scholar or philosopher ruminating on the four humours or writing theses about Atlantis or wondering how big a lever they'd need to move the world. They were people and people drink and shit and fuck and unless they're celibate or teetotal. Anyway, consider for a moment some of the graffiti found by archaeologists in the ruins of ancient Pompeii. There was the bland motivational shite peeps post on Facebook nowadays such as a small problem gets larger if you ignore it, or lovers are like bees in that they live a honeyed life. But there was plenty more graffiti that was risque or outright vulgar, like Solemnes, you screw well, or Theophilus, don't perform oral sex on girls against the city wall like a dog. And who could forget that all-time graffiti classic, I have buggered men. Please don't demonetize me, YouTube. I'm being educational. That reminds me, I really need to finish setting up that Patreon page. There were also scintillating gems of written wisdom as On April 19th I made bread, because the walls of Pompeii were pretty much the internet of its day. Nevertheless, despite this literal whitewashing of one of the primary themes in all human art, history and literature, the other being death of course, I am eager to explore the rest of Discovery Mode's little guided tours. It's obvious a lot of time, love, effort and research has gone into it and I wholeheartedly applaud the idea of games being adapted like this for different purposes. It's just an absolute crying bloody shame it had to be neutered like this to get it past Puritan school boards. Now, just so I am clear, I am not arguing that we bombard children with pornography. The modern world does that well enough without my help. No. All I'm saying is there are worthwhile classroom discussions to be had around historical attitudes towards sexuality, the human body and so forth, and giving educators options to filter things like the tit shells and wall porn can potentially facilitate such discussions in a way more conducive to learning. Oh, before I move on to my final news item, you might have seen some grumbling on social media about this ancient Greek vase allegedly having been photoshopped to better reflect modern sensibilities. Just so you know, that very same vase is in the British Museum and looks exactly as you see it here. The text on this screen refers to mixed gender school classes featured in the main game, whereas in historical ancient Greece, boys and girls were usually taught separately. That's it. That's the big controversy some dingbats are trying to stir up over this. Pay it no mind. 
In other news, Bandai Namco put out this short video featuring Tomoko Hiroki, producer on Dragon Ball Fighters, confirming the game will be getting a couple of much needed patches to fix ongoing issues, mostly regarding lobby disconnections and ring matches not working properly. A message that was well received by fans of Dragon Ball Fighters, more so perhaps than the news of two new characters coming to the game's roster very soon. The first of them is Bardock, who made his Dragon Ball debut in the 1990 TV special Dragon Ball Z Bardock the Father of Goku. So if you're a diehard fan of the spiky haired walking calamity himself, you'll be able to have a team of regular Super Saiyan Goku, Super Saiyan with blue hair Goku and his dad for absolute maximum Goku. The other character in this first DLC is called Broly, who first appeared in the 8th Dragon Ball movie, Dragon Ball Z Broly the Legendary Super Saiyan and has all the personality of a brick dipped in yellow paint. Added to the game's existing Saiyan characters of Super Saiyan Goku, the same Goku but with blue hair and different moves, Gotenks, Teen Gohan, Adult Gohan, Future Trunks, Super Saiyan Vegeta, Super Saiyan Blue Vegeta, Goku Black and Nappa, that's 12 characters from the same species out of a total of 24 characters in the game. God, it's almost like Mortal Kombat's rainbow of ninjas if one of the ninjas was bald. Given the numerous characters in Dragon Ball media, this feels like a missed opportunity to pleasantly surprise people. The game already lets Yamcha, fucking die to a kamikaze sprout man Yamcha, go toe to toe with a 1000 year old assassin that can stop time. So why not some more visually interesting non-Saiyan characters like Dodoria, Zarbon, Ribrien, or even Mr. Satan? He could be the Dragon Ball Fighters equivalent of Dan Hibiki from Street Fighter, except not completely inept. But then I'm rather a Johnny come lately to all this Dragon Ball malarkey. I only know that Bardock and Broly both have their fans, and that said fans could probably argue me into the dirt over why they should be added first. So joining me now to discuss this topic is the Emperor of Evil himself, Lord Freezer. It's Freezer, actually. Sorry? Freezer. The letter I is in my name for a reason, you know. Huh. Well, I am new to all things Dragon Ball. My apologies to you, Lord Freezer. Ha! You gullible little monkey. It's actually Freezer. You were correct the first time. <sighs> Very well, Lord Freezer. What was your reaction to the news that the first two new characters being added to the Dragon Ball Fighters roster are Broly and Bardock? Two big fan favourites, I understand. Oh, I was utterly overjoyed, because prancing, fighting monkeys with silly coloured hair are just so fucking underrepresented in this game, aren't they? Frankly, I'm amazed Arc System Works haven't just renamed the game to Dragon Ball Saiyans already. So, not keen on either of them then? Not keen. Not keen! I find it positively hifflish. Broly isn't even fucking canon. Seriously? Seriously, he wasn't designed by Akira Toriyama and he never appears in the manga, so that means he's not canon and never will be. Suck it up, fanboys. As for Bardock... <laughs> Lord Freezer? Sorry, I was lost in thought for a moment there. Just remembering how he died. Like a little bitch. As I blew up his planet. Okay. Do you have anything positive to say about these two new additions to the Dragon Ball Fighters roster? Hmm, oh my me, that is a tough question. Let me think. Hmm. Well, at least neither of them are Jiren. Who's he again? The big grey boring one from Universe 11. Oh gods, him. Christ, he's so fucking dull. I know, right? I mean, as much as I despise that wretched Saiyan Goku, at least he has some fucking personality. Irritating and arrogant as it may be. But then what do you expect from such a filthy, misbegotten race of benighted savages like the Saiyans? Sorry to interrupt, Lord Freezer, but could we perhaps keep the atrocious speciesism to a minimum? How dare you! Fuck you! I will not be spoken to as such by a tabby little vomit monger like your- You are not fit to lick the blood of dead Namekian children from the- I'm sorry, Lord Freezer, your signal appears to be breaking up. Black and white TV static doesn't happen with digital signals, you fat little sh- is not the 1990s anymore? He barely escaped being departed by YouTube because hardly anybody watched shit you churn out on a semi- Hardly surprising really, given you can't keep to a simple fact schedule, you lazy little c- Well, we appear to have lost Freezer there, so let's go now to our backup commenter, Perfect Cell. Hello, Mr. Cell. Hello. Sorry, I'm gonna have to stop you there, unfortunately. My producers just told me we're out of time. Damn you. Damn you. 
That's all for this episode of Pixel Burn. If you liked it, then please do let me know by clicking the requisite button down below, leaving a comment, or even sharing it with your friends, family, or local malware distributor. At the very least, I hope you found it tolerable. Meanwhile, till next time, as always, you can go now. It's not funny, is it, Mim? It's not funny at all.